Hello and welcome to our Sabbath School panel as we continue studying the Sabbath School quarterly titled Stewards in the Last Days, Part 1. This week we are studying Lesson 4, Conquering Bad Tendencies, Part 2. Before we dive in, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, as we continue our study of your word, we ask that you would help us to conquer bad tendencies, to overcome through your strength, that we can be your stewards, that we can be shining lights in this world, that we can show your integrity exemplified in our daily lives. We ask that you would help us to learn the lessons that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray and thank thee. Amen. Amen. Today on the panel, we have Brother Alex, Hello. Brother Septimiu, and myself, Bethany. Before we begin the main lesson of the day, we're first going to have a review of last week's lesson, Conquering Bad Tendencies, Part 1. If you would like to study along with us, you can find a digital copy by visiting sdarm.org slash publications. You can also find it on our mobile app through the Apple App Store or Google Play Store by simply searching for SDARM. Brother Septimiu? Yes, happy Sabbath. Hello. Good to be together to study God's Word. Um, I hope you had a blessed Sabbath morning so far. Let's dive in to review the lesson that we studied last week, Conquering Bad Tendencies, Part 1. So um, we were reading that Bible verse where it says, where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Um, we were discussing that envy, it's a grudging admiration, trying to get something or somewhat that someone has, envying. We don't want that to happen. We did discuss and we will review together how to conquer a couple of bad uh, tendencies Briefly, let's refresh our mind. We need to pray to God, maybe acquired tendencies or um, inherited tendencies, first of all. And uh, we need to recognize, to identify bad tendencies in us. For that, we need to study God's Word. That's where we find out. It says it's a two-edged sword, correct? We'll cut there. We'll discover where our heart may be deceitful. We may have problems. We may not know our own heart. So that's why we need to expose ourselves before the Word of God. I was just reading a very beautiful thought. He said, before using the Word of God as a sword, use it as a mirror. So we go to, to see ourselves in the mirror of the Word of God, and then we can use that Word properly. So, uh, let's read a very important sentence right there in the beginning, Education 137. Alex, please can you read that one? Whether we recognize it or not, we are stewards supplied from God with talents and facilities and placed in the world to do a work appointed by Him. Thank you. Some people may not know, but they are stewards. God appointed each one of us. We need to recognize that. Um, Stewards, sometimes when, when we don't follow God's plan, we may develop bad tendencies. Uh, that's uh, another sign that this world is not evolving, but is devolving, correct? Mm -hmm. So we need a power from above, a supernatural power, not natural, supernatural, to keep us on the right track, uh, to keep us away from bad tendencies. Um, where do the bad tendencies come from? They originated in heaven when Lucifer fell, and we see that he exemplified pride, envy, ambition for supremacy, these sorts of evil tendencies that we're going to look at in this lesson. We see they all originate with Lucifer. What was Lucifer, that tendency? How was it, was it developing there? Can, can you explain a little bit, Alex, how was coming up that bad tendency? Uh, it came as a result of his um, exaltation, of his desire to gain something which did not belong to him. He, uh, as we read in Isaiah, he set it in his mind and then he harbored in his mind for a while. Then he exercised the desire to exalt above the Most High, above, be above God. And as a result of that, he um, was you know, cast down and so forth. But we can see that the things that 
um, triggered all that, the, the things that sort of begun uh, are identified in the note here as pride and ambition that prompted him to complain about the government of God. Interesting choice of words here, complain, is tied to pride and ambition. You're, you're proud mm -hmm. and ambitious, and then you're unhappy with maybe the leadership or the, the, the what is happening in that particular situation. You begin complaining. And as you complain, you may find one or two that may think alike, and you begin forming sort of co coalition with each other. And that's how um, this, the rest is history. But Lucifer did not find other angels that were thinking alike him. He made them. He convinced hey. them. So he infused or he diffused that spirit of envy and discontent with the other angels. And we need to be aware of that bad tendency. Another bad tendency that um, is, is going hand in hand with envy is evil surmising. What is evil surmising? What do we get from that, Bethany? Evil Assuming surmising. the worst of others, automatically mm. thinking evil of others. And we see that that's a characteristic of a carnal mind I was mentioning. Envying, strife, divisions, and basically envying leads to, to strife and division. And as you mentioned, evil surmising, because you assume the worst of the other person. And then you're not going to get along with that other person either. What was, it, what was Satan or Lucifer evil surmising about God? that his government was unjust, that mm -hmm. he did not have uh, what it took to be the leader or to do what was necessary to be done. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, he sought to, um, you know, uh, rebel and dethrone God or, or excel above him to establish what he thought was the proper set of government rules and regulations mm -hmm. and so forth. And you know what, what makes me sad? Because we all know what happened. There was war in heaven. Him with his angels were cast down. And then he came here, uh, says in Revelation 12, woe unto you, earth. Yeah. Happy the heaven because he was cast out, but woe unto us. The problem was coming here. And then uh, he tempted uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, we all know the fall and all the misery that came in this world. Um, was Satan um, feeling that he's accountable for what he did? Did he take accountability? He did not. He blamed, correct? Instead of blaming God. Well, that's the problem with, with those that are developing these bad tendencies. Mm -hmm. We tend to be unhappy and we tend to what develop those, those tendencies as, as we'll review what those are you know, covetousness, pride, and, and so forth. But we tend to blame others for why we are in a situation mm -hmm. we are, because it's the easiest thing to do. Oh, I'm unhappy, it's their fault. Oh, I'm poor, it's his fault. Or I'm this, it's... it's that is the situation that we as, as Christians, unfortunately, tend to find ourselves more often in that than maybe taking accountability and, and, and taking responsibility for the things that are, that are happening as a result of our own action. Refreshing back a little bit our thoughts about envy. How does envy, with pride and ambition and everything that is linked together, how does envy affect our personality and even our health? A few thoughts. How can that affect our, our health, our personality? It mentioned that an envious person diffuses poison. And so obviously they, they poison themselves and they poison those around them also. Um, when they exhibit envy, because nobody wants to be around an envious person. And it says even in Proverbs, Proverbs 27, verse 4, who can stand against um, uh, or before envy? Mm -hmm. yeah. What and, does and affect it affect the health? It affects the health by, by being detrimental to us physically. And mm -hmm. here it uh, gives an example of rotting the bones as though killing. So it, it begins to wear out it, one individual and his well-being uh, and then ultimately bringing his own demise through, through death. Hmm. Um, something goes hand in hand with that. It says even alienating friends. 
We need to be very careful to pray, Lord, keep us away from envy, from pride and ambition. Uh, we want to conquer uh, if any of these bad tendencies may, uh, may take us in a certain corner of our heart, if we can put it that way, to pray, Lord, please help me to not open my heart to envy, to evil surmising. Please help me to open my heart to your Holy Spirit. Uh, we want to, to have the heart open to God because uh, goes um, a next um, evil tendency that we don't want to, to have that harboring in our mind, covetousness. Um, a few thoughts maybe we can recall about Achan that stands as a warning. Uh, how was his uh, covetousness uh, going? Was it immediately when he arrived in Jericho? Uh, when they were conquering Jericho, they, he, he became a, a covetous person? It's said in the note that covetousness is an evil of gradual development. And so covetousness is one of these things that it happens gradually. It seems like a little thing. It may be lightly regarded at first. And it's said that Achan had cherished this. He had cherished, cherished greed of gain until it finally became a habit binding him in fetters well nigh impossible to break. So obviously we see here that covetousness is a very powerful thing for evil, and yet it starts off gradually. Hmm. What can happen even with the family, Alex, if, if someone in the family is co a covetous person? It destroys the family. It destroys the family unit, which then leads to destruction of the church, because a, family, a church is made out of families, families. communities. Uh, so it speaks to this problem here as the note points out that this is not this type of character does not only exist in the world but exists in the church and when it says that it exists means that it's physically yes, here it's among us and therefore we are to heed the teachings that are being taught to us to to identify whether or not we have those types of, uh, you know, bad tendencies and, and, you know, rid them out and work them out as much as, you know, to, with God's help. Thank you. You know, there are a few, it says, uh, other sinners that make company for the covetous persons, and they are mentioned in Corinthians. It says, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, uh, can we think of Achan having the company of Judas or, or Belteshazzar, the, the vile king of Babylon, or Jezebel? Uh, that's the way a covetousness can lead to a, a very bad company. Extremely bad company. And we need to pray, Lord, please keep us away from this type of uh, bad tendency. It says in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says that um, the Ten Commandments strikes at the root of all evils. Um, there is another evil, another bad tendency that it's linked with this one, and that's the evil of greed. How can that affect, how does that affect the family, the, so the church, the society, the greed? How, how is the, the society, the church affected? The world, per se, per se altogether. Like covetousness, greed took, leads to destruction. But how does that happen? A lot of times through working maybe too much mm -hmm. and killing our health or killing our you know, spiritual health by working again too much or wanting to that that which does not belong to us. Uh, and um, here in the, in the note, it, it, uh, it paints the picture that still exists today, uh, this type of character. And here uh, we, we it identifies the type of greed that may be uh, prevailing still among us, which is the greed of uh, oppression and extortion, and uh, which is evident among us today. So it's an admonition that those that are having businesses or that are, you know, running a corporation are to practice those uh, wholesome character traits in as much as yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's something to be followed, you know. Uh, we need to think, first of all, about ourselves to be temperate. I was just talking with my dad. Uh, he got this spring some bees, uh, a new family of bees. They are Russian bees. And those bees are, are waking up a little bit late, like uh, 8, 9, 10 in the morning. 
only when it's warm outside and they go to sleep uh, around 5, 6 p.m., you know. Hmm. Uh, they do their work in this amount of time, which is the, the, a good shift of work. And then uh, we were talking, maybe these bees are lazy, but I said, no, they are temperate. <laughs> you know, they are not greedy. They, they produce some honey, they, but they are temperate. Um, it says that there is, uh, um, in Job chapter 5, verse 4, it says his children, the children of, of a greedy person, he says, are far from safety. What happens? Uh, uh, the parents don't make time for the children and so and so. They, they are thinking, let's provide more for the children and so. And then bad things are happening in the family. Um, we should not follow the, the, the course of this world in the greediness. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a sad picture that exists in the world today. We all know how much greediness is in the world, but we should avoid that. Um, something to keep in mind, when, um, when wicked people, it says in question C, how do wicked people reveal what is in their heart and mind? How is the greediness revealed? Because again, it's something in the mind and the heart. Is the greediness revealed? Um, it mentioned that it's to. boasting. Mm -hmm. Boasting, uh, being on the top. We should pray to God that some attributes like that should not be cherished among Christians. Because from that leads us into the next point that needs to be overcame, a bad tendency, pride. Um, what is pride? And how can be a Christian be overcame by pride? Pride is perhaps unjustified, um, grat mm, how do I say this? Uh, pride is being um, sort of re having received something from God that does not belong to you and being a th and taking it for granted as though it is yours all along. Taking credit. Taking credit for mm -hmm. something that is not yours. Yep. One of the definitions of pride. Yeah. How does God deal with uh, the proud heart? <laughs> does not deal well. Pride is an abomination is what the Bible says in Proverbs. Yeah. Uh, what does God do when a person is humble? What does God do with a humble person? He exalts the humble. So, what about the proud one? He has to. It says a base. Um, those that exalt themselves will be abased. And the reason for that is God wants our salvation. Mm -hmm. And so we can't be saved if we are prideful. And so in order to rid us of pride, God will have to put us through circumstances where we don't have so much to be proud of anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Why is pride so dangerous? Where does pride ultimately lead? It leads to destruction of destruction. any one individual, a church, an organization. But also, as we uh, point our attention here, something I thought about when it said uh, here under 4b, describe what the servant of the Lord had shown regarding the outcome of the proud and how it can be avoided. Um, I was thinking to the third angel's message, mm -hmm. the message for our day to day. And, you know, what does the third angel's, what does the third angel's message talk about? Uh, the message of worship, which, which leads to, uh, you know, Mark of the Beast and so forth. Mm -hmm. but, the, but it starts with worship, not, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Beast and its image. And when we are proud or when we are, you know, when we love uh, perhaps money or we, we have those other bad tendencies we discussed earlier, uh, covetousness and greed, that leads to the worship of one that is not God, which is ourselves and or, uh, you know, Satan. And therefore, it ultimately leads to, you know, breaking of God's commandments and ultimately destruction. Yeah. Whichever we make uh, more important than God, we make an idol, we yeah. worship that, right? Interesting because the third angel's message talks about if any, any man worship the beast and his image. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, still saying about those that worship the beast, uh, says that they don't have uh, rest. No day, no night. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. So we need to be temperate. Again, takes us back to, to not be greedy, covetous, but be temperate. 
and uh, and take rest you know because nowadays society is going again with the uh, overwork over time and all that stuff but it's better to be temperate it says they in testimonies for the church volume 1 132 133 says i saw that the third angel's message must yet work like leaven upon many hearts that profess to believe it and purge away their pride selfishness covetousness and the love of the world you, you have a thought no no go on um so uh going with that on question c says rather than pride god doesn't want us to be proud it says what is seen in the life of christian steward humbleness humbleness where do we learn that from jesus christ the ultimate um teacher of, of humbleness um, and he, and that is evident you know we can say well jesus you know came and in he showed how to be humble in the new testament but if we trace back even in the, in new test in old testament part of me moses he had developed that yeah so this uh tells me by comparing both old and new testament that this type of character trait can be acquired yeah. it isn't that anyone can say i can't do it you don't want to do it <laughs> but physically it is possible but not of your own it is the grace of God that, that sustains and fulfills that. So that that in itself is a very beautiful thought. That I thought. Yeah, and the great people of, of God, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, we look at their characters and they became so humble. You mentioned Moses. He says, if I recall correctly, in Patriarchs and Prophets says that he attained the heights of humility. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, another giant. He was an intellectual sure. giant there in Babylon. There were no other people that could rival with him and he was keeping humble. Uh, we all recall that amazing night when the Lord gave him the, the cornerstone of biblical prophecy, Daniel 2, with that statue, gold, silver, brass, uh, iron and clay and, and all that statue. And in the morning, it says that Daniel woke up and he gave thanks to the Lord. Lord, thank you for, for the interpretation, for the dream, for everything. He goes politely to Ariok. He says, please take me to the king. I do have the dream and the interpretation. Now, Ariok wants to take credit. He goes to the king. He says, I have found someone that can give the interpretation. And there comes Daniel and the king says, are you able? That was a big temptation. Because Daniel could say, oh, yes, 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 yes. I can help with that. But Daniel says, no, there is a God in heaven. He was completely humble. And he's, he confessed later, he says, not because there is any more special wisdom in me, but it's because of God that was merciful. Uh, uh, humility is a characteristic of those that are faithful to God. Mm. And uh, we should pray God, keep us humble, and let us keep pride away, overcome this bad tendency. Let's go to... Um, uh, the last bad tendency that we discussed now in the review lesson, and then I know there will be a few more tendencies to, to cover in the main lesson. Um, we focus a little bit now in the last part, the love of money. What will the love of money bring to you, to each one of us? We see a key here that money itself is not the problem. It's okay to have money. It's the love of money, or I'd like to think about it as making money the, the driving force of your life, that's what is the issue because it's talking about loving money more than God. And that becomes an idol. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's a big temptation for many, uh, many people. Many of us could be tempted to, to, to work more, to, to uh, try to accumulate more, and then with what cost? maybe spiritual costs, maybe health. Probably we all read those sentences where it says people spend uh, 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 their health to gain money and then they spend their money to regain the health. Yeah. And not only physical health, but maybe spiritual, that is way more important than the physical, but we all know that they are connected. There are two words to keep in mind, love of money or absorbed. We should pray 
to God to be uh, kept away from these bad tendencies. And I would like to end in a positive note. What is the top priority in the life of every faithful steward of God? What is the top priority? To look at the cross, to be led by the cross, and to yeah. reflect the cross. And there we find the riches of the God's amazing grace. And one day we'll be with Him, the owner of the entire universe. You know, mm -hmm. if we are faithful in little things that He gives us today, we will be faithful in, in more things that He will entrust one day to all His faithful ones. Let's pray to God to take us at the cross, to kneel there, to reach the highest place where we can all reach and to overcome all the evil tendencies, the bad tendencies, and to be good stewards for God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Septimiu. Thank you. We'll now move on to the main lesson of the day, Conquering Bad Tendencies, Part 2. Brother Alex. Thank you, Sister. Uh, we're going to continue where uh, Brother Timmy left off. And as Sister pointed out, Sister Bethany, this is Part 2, so the ones that have been reached, uh, identified so far, are not the only ones that exist, yeah. right? We talked about envy, covetousness, greed, pride, love of money. And today we'll, we'll go on to talk about deception, dishonesty, injustice, uh, and bad company, and, um, and the lust of riches or the, or the desire of riches. So we'll be identifying why those things that are now not so much touching us internally, right? Because we've talked about the things that were so somewhat internal to each one of us that can be masked somehow still, though it may be difficult, but still can, we can mask, you know, maybe greed or pride or covetousness or mm -hmm. envy. Now, when we talk about, you know, injustice or bad company or, or lust uh, after those things, they are now a little bit more outward. You can see what those things interactions. are. In interactions, as you pointed out. So we read in Matthew 13, 22. We read in Matthew as our uh, thought of meditation taken from the book of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to 13, 22 in the book of Matthew. And it says, He also that received seed among the thorns, the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Yeah. Couple things here as, um, as we meditate upon Matthew. What is happening with these bad tendencies that we are now discussing? What do they do with us? What do they have a tendency to do with, with, with us uh, according to Matthew? They choke. Mm -hmm. they, 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 how can we say? They clog the, the, the good uh, flow that comes from the Word of God. The Word of God help us to become fruitful, not yeah. uh, unfruitful, to become good Christians, good followers of Christ, but uh, says that the deceitfulness, mm -hmm. uh, at least if they would be a reality, you know, an everlasting reality, but it's just a deceitfulness, uh, what today may be extremely valuable, today may lose entire value, and it says chokes the world, the, the word in the heart. And the heart becomes an empty ground. Bethany, do you notice the last portion of this um, verse? What does it say? Can you please uh, reference it maybe? It says he becomes unfruitful. And this is particularly talking about the parable where mm -hmm. it's talking about the seed that was sown. And we know that the seed is the word of God. Yeah. And so the seed is, is received in the ground, but it says there's thorns. And these thorns are the care of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, these things that that grow and do not allow the Word of God to be fruitful, to bear fruit in our lives. And instead of the good tendencies, the fruits of the Spirit that should be exemplified in our lives, we start seeing these bad tendencies. And I think a big one is the care of this world. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that you had bad intentions, but the cares of this world, all the weeds, they grow a lot of times faster than the good plants. And unless we take care to not be burdened with the cares of this life, then we are in danger of this sad reality that we are looking at here in Matthew 13. Thank you. Uh, the both of you pointed out the, the thought that I found so interesting that we become unfruitful. 
doesn't necessarily mean that we die mm -hmm. as a plant you may continue to grow but if you bear no fruit any longer what value do you gain yeah. what value do you do you offer to the world yeah. you know um what there was a scenario how many of you recall the the scenario where jesus walked by the by the by the tree the fig tree, fig tree yeah. and he found on it what leaves beautiful lushy green leaves mm -hmm. and it had nothing as far as what as fruit. far as the fruit the very thing that it was designed to produce and so what was the consequence of that do you guys recall what what did he cursed. tell uh it was cursed it was cursed that's right and and it was uh, withered the next time they passed yeah. by so yeah. this is what the lord is preventing us from doing so brothers and sisters friends as you as you look at these tendencies as you study the sabbath schools figure out which ones of these are applicable to you it is possible that none of the things we covered last week are the ones you're struggling with and let's see now if if something that we'll be discussing today might be the one that you're struggling with and pray that the lord sends his angels to help you overcome it because it is possible through his strength Timmy, did you makes have a me, thought? It makes me think, you know, the um, illustration that the Lord gave about sowing the seed and then other weeds are growing, you know, and then it chokes the, the real plant, the, 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 the Word of God. Um, so basically, what do we need to do? We need to weed out, to yeah. pull the weeds. Uh, basically, the deceitfulness of riches, Christ compares them with weeds in that case, yeah. correct? Compare with the beauty of the Word of God that brings us salvation, eternal salvation. Uh, you know, um, a plant, a real vegetable that it's uh, choked with uh, weeds. Uh, it's um, a little bit uh, skinnier per yeah. se, sometimes become yellowish. And you see that it's not happy. As soon as you pull the weeds around, it's so happy mm. again and, and it, it will bring fruits. Yeah. So the, the Lord wants us to take away the deceitfulness of, of the weeds. Yeah, take a very, very good point. The note says, All money lovers will one day cry in bitter anguish, All the deceitfulness of riches, I have sold my soul for money. Hmm. Mm. So clearly the, the lesson begins uh, identifying or emphasizing where we left off, right? Yeah. With Timmy, Loving. which is the love of money. But now we'll be going into beyond just the love of money, into the, into the result of that and the character traits and attributes that it brings out in us. You know, uh, uh, there is a saying that if you wish to uh, lose a friend, give, lend them money, you know, because that tends to bring all sorts of issues amongst the people. Uh, you know, when one is due to repay and he or she mm -hmm. fails to because um, they chose to not. So we go, we go on to the Sunday's lesson, join with us as we talk about deception. How does Satan often prevent the heart and the mouth of people who want to take unfair advantage in business transaction? Pervert, mm -hmm. uh, pardon, pardon me. How does Satan often pervert the heart and mouth of people? It's interesting here because obviously there's there's two components to this. Satan he perverts the heart. First he makes the person want to do the wrong thing, right? That's the the issue of the heart. And then the mouth. Mm -hmm. And the, looking at the title of deception, we see that they want to take a fair unfair advantage. So that's the issue of the heart, right? And then in order to do that, they're going to use deception in order to get away with it. Uh, Timmy, who is immune from that? And I was thinking about that. Absolutely yeah. nobody. What examples uh, are being brought up here? Says they in Jeremiah, it says, from the least even to the greatest. So that means no matter responsibility, whatever responsibility a person can have or, or importance in the society is not immune. He says it's given to covetousness, Jeremiah 6, 13. And he says, from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Uh, we, we do know uh, a little bit about the history of Israel, but they, we are not to discuss about them like about history. We are, says, says Apostle Paul, they, these are examples for us. Mm -hmm. And to learn, to be aware, to be careful, because it says no matter where you are, in which responsibility you are, no matter the title, 
how fancy the title may look, but he says every person, every, every responsibility, everyone, he says, is under risk of such a tendency. We have an example, Bethany. Do you know uh, what example is being brought up here in Acts as, as you're following us along? What, what example does come to mind and is identified here in the lesson from the book of Acts chapter 5? We have the example of Ananias and Sapphira. And it says in Acts 5, 3 and 4, it says, Ananias, why hath Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. If we know the story, we know that it was their land. They could do whatever they wanted with it. The issue was lying. They said it was the full amount. Why? To look good, right? Mm. To look good to their friends, to the church, to whoever. And it says they didn't lie just to men. They didn't just lie to Peter or whoever else was there. No, they lied to God. Mm. And that is such a, such a warning for us because, of course, we know what the result of that was. It was death. Men, they could deceive, right? They did that successfully in, in, in terms of deceiving men and, uh, and um, appearing, as you pointed out, better for having sold or given away a certain portion. But when they wanted to, you know, reassess that, they themselves said, mm, maybe not. Hmm. I want to think beyond just money, right? I, clearly, this example here is financially. But what happens when we, for example, make a, make a, make a commitment to God uh, at the yeah. baptism and later the thorns of this world choke. Are, they choke our desire to follow God or come to church or... Or what happens to the principles to which we committed? Uh, Timmy, as a pastor, can you talk, talk to us more about what, what transpires in one's heart when they deceive themselves in thinking it's not bad. I still follow God. I just do it in my own heart. And I don't need anyone to tell me what I should do. Hmm. We do know. We do need God. Um, you know, uh, calls right now as you were asking a question calls to my mind a lot of bible verses you know god says remember yeah uh, the sabbath day but he tells us to remember a lot of things in the old testament he was saying in deuteronomy repeat to your children when they wake up when they lay down when you are walking with them we need to repeat and to reaffirm to reassure our covenant was with god amen uh, when we pledge we do the pledge, it says that the heavenly three of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are present. The angels are witnesses to, to the covenant that we made. We should not allow um, God to, uh, we should not allow uh, the, the things of this world to fade off uh, the covenant that we made with God. You know, each one of us, we do recall when we were born, the day when we were born. How about uh, trying to recall when we were born again? through baptism mm -hmm. covenant with God. Remember that special day. Each one of us, we should remember and refresh it. In the, um, for the message for the last church applicable to us, Laodicea, it says, uh, um, you, you have lost something. Your first love. Uh, actually, I'm sorry about the, the first church, Ephesus, but it's still valid to Laodicea, mm -hmm. the first love to remember what, what, what covenant we made with God and um, uh, everything that we promised to God, basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if we had the privilege to have the, I don't know, the baptismal service recorded, watch it from time to time. Very good point. You know, to, to see uh, those moments when we had the first love with God, to refresh it. You're bringing exactly the, the point that came that crossed my mind, the deception we give ourselves that those things are no longer applicable, the ones to which we committed, because yeah. it no longer meets our lifestyle or some portion of it we disagree with. And then we begin questioning all of it, and then we just ultimately throw it all away. Yeah. And uh, as we go on here, what did David and Solomon both aspire freedom from uh, as far as, you know, um, the, pe the people around them? What, what, what they were subjected to and what the Bible is teaching us and wants to prevent us from falling in the same pit. 
man, it was not easy because both of them, they were leaders there. Yeah. And uh, uh, they had certain uh, officers there or certain people that were deceptive, you know, trying to gain some advantages there. I do recall, for example, the great rebellion of Absalom. Uh, there were some people that were ready to take advantage that time. Was one guy, uh, Shimei, was uh, someone from the house of King Saul. When he saw David oppressed and with all his problems, says, "Oh, man of blood, dog, you you deserve to be cursed and so and so." And as soon as it happened that David was reinstated, Absalom rebellion was crushed. What did Shimei do? He came back and he says, "Oh, forgive me and so and so." There was uh, other people that were trying to do so. Uh, Ziba, the servant of Mehiboshet. Now, when David was about to die, he gave instruction to Solomon. He says, be careful with these persons, with, with Job as well, that shed innocent blood. Mm -hmm. He was deceptive. He says that he kissed Amasa with the right hand and with the left hand, he was stabbing the, the guy died. Right. And he says in Psalms, he says, he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. And then he gave one of the last instructions before he died. He told Solomon, be careful with such people, with mm -hmm. so and so. And then Solomon had to be careful as well. He says, remove, uh, Proverbs 30 verse 8, remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. He was praying, Lord, keep me away neither poverty nor riches and remove uh, uh, lies. Yeah, well, that line said, lives. Thank you. Yes. Uh, let's segue and discuss that for just a moment. Um, why did David and Solomon, you partially already discussed this, but why were they praying for the Lord to remove lying lips from their house? To not hear it, to, to not be subjected to that, to not, to not plant the seed of a lie in their mind about so and so right that there's so much wisdom we can learn here and how they dealt with it yeah. and how we are to deal with it with it and likewise today when someone wishes to tell us something you know and we're because we might be friends or because we have that acquaintance familiar um you know acquaintance with with each other we may allow them to share a gossip that may not be a gossip but it it could be a lie or an unnecessary truth that we don't need to know. Yeah. And so we need, to, we need to exercise the same principles that Solomon and David said. They prayed, remove as far as possible from the house. Yeah. Remove it far from me. Let's the, go on. Please, I'm the, sorry, Bethany. The problem with lies is once somebody lies mm -hmm. about one thing, they're going to be a liar. Sure. They're going to lie about you. They're going to lie about something else. And that's the problem with deception. It isn't going to just be one lie. It's going to be a habitual pattern. What prayer should we often um, raise to, to, to God when, when, we, when we are in those types of situations? What does it say in Psalms 43, part one, uh, mm -hmm. verse 1, first, uh, last part? It says, Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Meaning that uh, here David is praying for an escape. Yeah. Because he was surrounded uh, a portion of his life by what? People who there were some that obviously had his best interest. But there were some that uh, would report to, to, to Saul. Uh, Saul. And so he had dealt with it personally. And he's praying saying, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man that would find ways to kill him, take his life, bring rumors and other types of things to, to Saul. And that is the prayer that we should be making. And as we conclude here, the Sunday's uh, section on deception, how does God often permit a deceitful person to be a victim of his or her own hmm. tricks? That's an interesting one. That's God's providence. Mm -hmm. It says uh, in Psalm 7, 14 through 16, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and had conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and dig it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. And now God may allow the very person that created a terrible situation, uh, constructing a situation for someone else to fall, exactly the creator of such a situation to fall into that. Yeah. Or 
reminds me of the story of Esther and Haman and Favorite Mordecai, point. right? Where yeah. Haman used deception against the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the king liked Mordecai. He wasn't about to hang Mordecai, and yet Haman used deception to try to get his pit, so to speak, mm -hmm. to get Mordecai killed. And who ended up getting mm -hmm. hanged? Haman. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in the previous lesson, uh, T uh, Timmy brought up uh, the experience of Daniel. And what did they sought to do with him? In the lion's and they throw, sought to throw him for having an integrity and standing for, for all those uh, uh, you know, principles that he committed to. And through deceit, like the experience of Esther and many others, he too was found um, uh, pronounced guilty, though he was innocent, and the Lord spared his life. So, though we might be often in a situation where there's some deceit around us, and uh, there's some deception around our name that is uh, escalating, let's pray that we find a way to, uh, that we can um, find a way to overcome it, and um, not allow that to influence our lives. Let's move on to Monday's lesson here, just honesty another uh, bad tendency to overcome so lying leads to dishonesty right mm -hmm. describe the depth of evil that occurs when we injure the reputation of uh, of others and how god sees it hmm. how does god see when we when we do something to one that injures them uh, in the note uh, it says we think with horror of the cannibal that it's the flesh of the person. Yeah. But with the mouth speaking, bad things injuring the reputation. So that this could be like what? Uh, spiritual cannibalism or, or yeah. something like that. It says God uh, hates such a thing. It says in Proverbs, a uh, naughty person, a wicked man walketh with a froward mouth, teacheth with his fingers, mischief a proud look, a lying tongue, wicked imaginations. He says that all this is an abomination before the Lord. He says that, um, I would actually like to read the first paragraph of the Please. note. He says, we think with horror of the cannibal who feasts on the still warm and trembling flesh of his victim. But other results of even this practice more terrible than are the agony and ruin caused by misrepresenting motive, blackening reputation and dissecting character. Now that's a very serious thing that should stop among Christians. A follower of Christ could not misrepresent motives of others. Uh, who are we to judge the motives of the others? It says judge uh, not to not be judged, mm -hmm. correct? It says blackening the reputation. We may misunderstand someone's actions, but we need to be careful to not blacken the reputation uh, or dissecting the character. Yeah. We never walked in no one else's shoes. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to be careful to not dissect the character. It says next day the spirit of gossip and tell bearing um, is, is, one. is one of Satan's special agencies to sow discord and strife to separate friends and to undermine the faith of many in the truthfulness of our positions. Yeah. It's terrible, something that should be put away. We need to pray, God, please keep us away from such things. As you were pointing out <clears throat> in the previous lesson, we talked about filling the blanks that we do as individuals. So when we see a certain man or a woman and we make up our own interpretation of the facts that we, that we don't have at our disposal, but we see some other just parts of their life that may lead us to make up and, and you know allow our imagination to fill in the blanks. And that here is, uh, is defined here as the spirit of gossip and tell bearing. And from whom it comes? Satan. Satan. And he has his special agents to do likewise here among us. Uh, when recently in my church, we had a conversation and um, I asked, is gossip 
or can gossip be considered an open sin? And I know open sins are uh, there. We have a whole study on what is an open sin and, and how to over, you know how to overcome. But I think to a large degree, gossip or you know somehow it can be classified or attributed to an open sin because it you or you're openly making up a lie or or untruth about some brother or sister though that's a different study but think about the the gross um weight and the and the result of gossip that can have notice in the proverbs he said his calamity shall come suddenly he will be broken without remedy as uh, as timmy had broke uh, had pointed out so the lord is telling us that when we are dishonest when we gossip when we talk about someone that we have no business the, the this is an immediate uh, this particular you know bad trait has an immediate reaction that will follow uh, like the there are many bible promises that have a positive reaction you know for example the fifth commandment honor thy mother and thy father that thy days may be lengthened and blessed upon this earth here the 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 trade of deception and lying and tell bearing has a negative um, promise that will follow uh, shortly. How does the Lord consider those who are dishonest in financial transactions? Hmm. Uh, being a uh, a finance uh, uh, expert, uh, Bethany, can you speak more to to what does the Lord speak about finances? Well, it's interesting here because we we already talked about last week a little sure. bit a false balance, diverse weights, so on and so forth. But I really thought that the that the note was relevant to this day and Please. age because there's this key word. There's there's auditors, right? In in accounting, we're always thinking about okay, be prepared in case there's an audit. But how often do we realize that God is really the auditor? The unseen auditor. Right, and it says the accounts of every business, the details of every transaction, pass the scrutiny of unseen auditors, agents of him who never compromises with injustice, never overlooks evil, never palliates wrong. Against every evildoer, God's law utters condemnation. When we think about this, this is not just an audit of the books, so to speak. This is an audit of even the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yeah. What motive you had when you did this or that business transaction. As you're sharing this about the, uh, the unseen auditor, there is a story that I heard shared with me many years ago. Uh, in the countryside, a boy was traveling with his, with his father with a horse and buggy along the orchard. So I think you believe apple orchard. And so the father all of a sudden sees some pallets of apples have been picked and ready for pickup perhaps at a later in the evening by a, by a truck or another buggy. And so the father stops and grabs and, and, and puts the, the apples, the, the, the um, you know, container of apples in his cart. And, uh, but, but before he, that he looks left and he looks right as though to make sure no one sees him. And his son says to him, Dad, you forgot to look up, hmm. and it, in, it's a. Uh, I'm not entirely confident of, of the facts of this story and how exactly it went, but it does carry a deep meaning in that we tend to look. Will we be caught by an individual or an organization or or whatever IRS? But will the Lord? How will the Lord react to our dishonesty? Yeah. And see as we like, uh, finish up here on the Monday. What will happen to anything that is acquired dishonestly? Hmm. It says that wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. Yeah. It says again in Proverbs, He that is greedy of gain troubled his own house. Consequences will follow. Uh, there is um, an important principle brought up from the book of education. It says no scheme of business or plan of life can be sound or complete that embraces only the brief years of this present life and makes no provision for the unending future. Um, everything that, that happens today will have consequences of, in tomorrow. Uh, there was brought there, for example, from Deuteronomy in the previous question, uh, says, Cursed 
be he that removed his neighbor's landmark, you know, uh, the land, the crown, you know, the landmarks. Uh, there's a curse coming following later. Every dishonesty, making uh, the blind wander, perverting judgment, and so on. So everything will have its consequences sooner or later. Um, bad things, as according with the second commandment, it can happen even to the third and fourth generation. Sure. Uh, but if we repent, he says, God has mercy up to the thousand generations. Amen. I think something important here is that even if you get away with it, so to speak, you can't escape your conscience. That's a good, that's a good point. And so, yes, people might, so, so it seems, be able to gain dishonestly, but it says that it'll be diminished. But not only that, they have to live with that on their conscience. Provided it hasn't been uh, burned with, right. uh, with an iron, right? So we, we talked about deception. We talked about dishonesty as the two character traits that are bad, that the Lord frowns upon. And in fact, here, I believe in, uh, in Proverbs, the Lord says, a lying lip is an abomination to the Lord. So talking mm -hmm. about, you know, dishonesty. So now we're going to injustice. And injustice is something we see a lot of in our world. I mean, we, um, we, we continue to have the war that takes place in, in Europe. The injustice that towards the men and women on either side, you know, is, is there, is, is evident. So how does, the, how does the Lord teach us to, and how does he warn us to avoid partiality in our dealings with others? Hmm especially as we deal about injustice. Why is this such a, an important thing? And we actually covered, uh, Timmy, you covered it a little bit uh, in, uh, in the previous lesson uh, when we talked about the bad tendencies, um, about being impartial as God is impartial. But, and even being a good steward also means, means being impartial. So I'm kind of connecting the three lessons. And now we're coming to the injustice as it deals with impartiality. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, because when we, when we are partial, <laughs> obviously one is favored and the other one is... Uh, sure. It doesn't receive that much. Um, there is a, um, a lot of examples in the Bible and it starts even in the family. Uh, making one of the child more favorite than, than the other. Um, it says in Leviticus, he shall do no unrighteous in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. What does that mean? It says be equal. Don't yeah. show partiality. Um, um, in the last part of the note says very clearly, it says no one of you needs to be afraid of the other. Because uh, sometimes we are partial because we are afraid or we may, be, may have someone favorite. He says, lest the other shall have the highest place. He says, without partiality and without hypocrisy, each is to be treated. Um, and uh, this can affect us in any kind of level. For example, in the society, uh, someone that is uh, in a higher office is well treated by, uh, by, sure. uh, by another office. No, and he says this should not be among Christians. Uh, um, even in the our interaction in the missionary work, we are all equal. Mm -hmm. That's what what Christ taught us. He says you are all brothers. Yeah. Uh, correct. You know, uh, we do have uh, to to make some difference uh, among ourselves. Uh, in the society, in the Christian family, we do have certain responsibilities. And uh, we should avoid thinking of those responsibilities that a person deserves more than another person. Hmm. It's, 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 it's not something, I mean, Lord Jesus Christ, how was he called? The servant of the servants, correct? Right, the so he was servant number one, correct? How about if we will be called server number two, server number three, and so and so? Not, uh, I don't know, whatever. Master names, chief, uh, whatever. Hi hierarchical names. Uh, yes, we may use it's important to be organized and to work organized, but it says we should not show partiality. We should be humble and respectfully with each one of us equally, to be treating as Christ treated. 
then the, the beginning of the same note, uh, those that are following us along, we are in 3A. Do not show partiality to one or more and neglect other of your brethren because they are not congenial to you. What does congenial to mean? Congenial to us. What, what does it mean? They're not maybe palatable or presentable or they're not fitting our maybe a lifestyle or social norms or standards, right? They're just different. Beware lest you deal hastily, harshly, pardon me, with those who you think have made mistakes, while others more guilty and more deserving of reproof, who mm. should be severely rebuked of their unchristlike conduct, are sustained and treated as friends. That's a big lesson there. Fascinating. I, I've seen in churches, and maybe your experience is different, but I have witnessed where there's brethren that we know are living in sin, but because they are perhaps a wealthy donor, we tend to be soft in approaching them versus someone that is a regular member and they fall in the same equal sin, we go and immediately rebuke them. Just, just think about these things. That, that is a evidence of, an in, of injustice. Um, let's go on here to B and, and discuss further. What does the Christian steward do when dealing with disadvantaged groups? It says basically to do justice. In Psalm 82, it said, how long will you judge unjustly? And so we see here the, the contrast to that would be to do justice. And we know that the only true example that we can find of the perfect justice is God because he has that perfect blend of justice and mercy. And so when it says to do justice, right, we see to basically defend the less advantaged, defend, it said, the poor and fatherless, to deliver the poor and needy. Um, and it's interesting in the note, it said that God requires that his people should not allow the poor and afflicted to be oppressed. And it basically says that we are to be unselfish and kindly considerate. And so when we use these two these two principles in all our dealings unselfishness and kind consideration especially to those that are less fortunate than ourselves we see the the way or the path to do justice instead mm -hmm. of injustice mm -hmm. thank you and when we are talking about injustice we are not only to to not do injustice but it says that god has made us guardians mm -hmm. when injustice is happening we need to be guardians to help those that receive un injustice. Very good point. Bethany, as you were sharing about, you know, the, 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 the passage from Psalms about defending the poor, doing justice, delivering the poor uh, and needy, I'm reminded of uh, James 127. What does it say there? Pure religion and mm -hmm. undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So here we're seeing that this is how we are showing evidence of our religion, of our Christianity, of the belief that we profess by keeping these principles and by exercising them. But if we are not, and we are only, you know, kind to the ones that are kind back to us or whatever, that speaks what? That our religion is empty. It has, it's void of, of Christ. Mm. Uh, here in the note, um, a bit in the middle towards the um, middle of the first paragraph, the stumbling block referred to in the word of God does not mean a block of wood placed before the feet of the a blind to cause him to mm -hmm. stumble but it means much more than this it means any course that may be pursued to injure to injure the influence of the of their blind brother to work against his interest or to hinder his prosperity it goes now far beyond just an immediate injustice by not giving them water when they need or whatever but here it goes to the interest and their uh, and their uh, and the and the ability what you could have done but you avoid it, and that in itself is just as much as an injustice, than just simply maybe being you know physically offensive or whatever. 
very, very eye-opening, very deep, I thought, the way the Spirit of Prophecy is writing. And then, the, it's to summarize this, how or what warning is given to the Church of God in the note here towards the end. And the Church of God who have permitted their unfortunate brothers to be wrongful, wronged will be guilty of sin until they do all in their power to have the wrong righted. So here it says that that responsibility doesn't fall only on the brother who has committed that. But when you or Timmy or I or others that are watching us, you get to know of something that takes place that is contrary to the Word of God. It is your time to be proactive. It is your time to step up and, and speak and help exalt and you know teach. Apply the principles you've learned and you've gained. Otherwise, our churches will be what? They will be guilty of sin and they will not be profited. Let's move on to the lesson number four, avoiding bad company. We're moving from an injustice that we do um, to one another to what injustice can be done to us, avoiding bad company. Well, the Lord is our great counselor from whom may we seek counsel on this earth. Hmm. We tend to go to whom? Our friends, our, friends. our parents, mm -hmm. to a large degree, we go to our parents, our uncles and aunts, and because they have experience, they've lived a life and they've seen one, one, a thing or two, as we say, and they can share their testimony. It's better if we go to our parents rather than friends in yeah. uh, the world. Yeah, and, and what does it say in Proverbs, Timmy? What does he the that Bible... walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So, um, especially the second part, that means that um, when we choose that company, we are part of that companion. Yeah. Uh, and do, do we want to be there, to be destroyed? We don't want that. Uh, so, it's, it's just to walk with a wise man, to be wise, yeah. to look um, for, for wisdom. Obviously, we can, uh, if we are privileged to have God-fearing parents, that's um, that's number one. We need to look there to, to ask them for advice. Uh, it's a tendency, you know, um, when we are young to talk with the other young people to get counsel from there. But uh, what experience do they have of life? You know, um, they might have to a certain degree, but uh, think about Solomon. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, when he was a young king, he was asking advice uh, from the older ones and from the younger ones. And um, we know what happened a little bit uh, uh, about him. No, not Solomon, his son. Forgive me. Uh, his son, Roboam. So um, by choosing our companions, uh, we may choose uh, fear of the Lord or disobedience of the Lord. And then we choose um, salvation or we choose destruction. If we find wisdom, says in Daniel 12, 3, it says that uh, those that teach others to uh, uh, the, the way of righteousness will be shining like stars forever and ever. Wisdom of righteousness, we need to look for that, Amen. not for the companions that distract. Uh, if we can, it is um, to help someone, but not to make it as a company, to make it as something that we could help, but not to choose them. And especially, especially I do emphasize here for the young generation, those of you that are attending colleges, different schools, um, especially where it's taught disbelieving God's word, doubts and infidelity. Because the philosophy of this world, the science that is considered the mother of all sciences, philosophy, is the science of doubt. Do not go into the science of doubting, okay, because that leads towards destruction. We need to keep those companies away. Timmy, you mentioned something that those that um, have the opportunity and privilege to be born into a Christian home should seek counsel from their parents. Uh, and then uh, in Ephesians, I believe it says that uh, ye who are, you know, uh, godly parents are to be the, uh, the teachers and so forth. What happens, and maybe our listeners and our viewers may not have the privilege and the opportunity to be born into a, a Christian home. And perhaps many of us come from a home, broken home. 
uh, where either one parent is missing or parents are just don't have that you know Christian intelligence how to properly educate and give advice what can we give uh, as far as you know the spirit of prophecy in the Bible what can we tell them what what can be taught of this as far well, uh, when we're talking about bad company you know it's amazing I met certain Christians they they got converted they they have a beautiful relation with the Lord and then when I spent some time with them they were telling me you know about uh, an older Christian person he says that person is like a, a spiritual mother for yeah. me or that uh, that brother is like a spiritual father for me you know we may find uh, uh, Christian friends maybe a little bit older than us or maybe even the same age like us or sometimes even a little bit younger we are not to be proud, okay, because someone is younger than us or older, but we may find a friend, a brother, a sister. Uh, we may find a, a pastor uh, connected with God's word that gives a good counsel, a wise counsel. Amen. And we should look there. We should look for, for that company, you know. When, when, when we don't have, uh, you know, the situation of life brought us in different ways, uh, when we don't have that family, God-fearing parents, we are to look for the church family. That's why sometimes it's encouraged to have in our local churches uh, programs in the afternoon where it encourages us to become like a church family, like a family where we find our uh, father or mother in Israel. That's an expression used in the spirit of prophecy or brothers and sisters mm -hmm. to encourage us to avoid bad companies, to keep good companies. Thank you for sharing that. So it means that we have to develop a such character that we can be a witness to someone yeah. and, and witness to those that are less fortunate, who did not bring, you know, who did, were, were not raised with that uh, God-fearing parent by their side. What must we consider regarding persons not in harmony with the principle of Christian stewardship? So, Bethany, can you please help us with that a bit? I think some thing important here is that we realize the power of influence. Okay. Whether that be good, the influence of somebody who's pure and holy, that has a fear of God, that's an example of good principles, as you already mentioned, or in this case, the power of influence, it says, of a foolish man, or it says from someone that walks disorderly, as it said in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, or in other words, not after the order of heaven, someone mm -hmm. that's not following the principles of good stewardship or that's in harmony with God's principles in general, it says that if we, if we hang around those people, if we choose those people to be our associates, we will end up being polluted. Why? Because by nature, the evil tends to be the bigger influence mm -hmm. than the good, right? And it says in the note, silent and unconscious influences weave their sentiments into lives and become a part of their very existence. They walk on the brink of a precipice and sense no danger. So I think the issue here is that if you hang around with people that don't follow God or that don't put these principles into practice and instead are exhibiting the bad tendencies that we've been talking about for the last two weeks, you'll end up thinking that's normal. And so it'll sure. end up being a part of your life too. Yeah, you know, if I can share something, one of the greatest tools that God used in my life to stay close to Him, especially after I got baptized and uh, I went to study in college and so, was, um, yes, they were the, the Sabbath school programs, the, the Sabbath programs, but the greatest tool was the prayer meetings uh, in the middle of the week with fellow students that had different struggles like I had, you know, different problems in school and so, and we're meeting to pray for one another, to share our experiences, our troubles that we're facing. Uh, and I do uh, uh, cherish those precious moments of the good company of a few young people who are meeting there. Sometimes we're not that many, sometimes maybe we're 15, 16, 17, sometimes we're five, six or three. But uh, uh, the unconscious influences from the Word of God can, uh, can counterbalance the unconscious influences from the world. And especially when we are students, we need to, to be careful in the, during our youth to avoid bad companies. And it says, 
and we may not change that company so we can withdraw ourselves from there yeah. and to look for a good company very good point so those that are watching us uh, as you're studying and you're going to college or university and you may have to be further from a home church or from, you know, from your family a couple of things you can still find a way to connect online uh, via zoom or, or live stream to to a church where you can be part of a prayer meeting there's many opportunities available and we encourage you to reach out and ask for help uh, there, there are people on standby who are willing to help and, and are ready so number one withdraw yourself from an association that where you you have an you think you might be led down the wrong path and number two join yourself to a, a group that can help you overcome those things that you are um, in, that you are dealing with and Timmy as you were sharing uh, one of the things that helped me personally, yes, prayer meeting, attending church, but also getting involved in projects. And mm -hmm. if there's not one, because perhaps the church is too small uh, and there's fewer members than you would want, develop your own project. Come up with an idea that you can find and, and get engaged and ask the Lord for help. And that will give you a way to, um, to, to keep your mind occupied. And yes, you're in school, your work, you're focusing on that, you're traveling, whatever, but you have this other thing, this other project that is in the back of your mind and you find ways to make it better by using experiences from each one of those things that you interact and saying, how can I apply the better, uh, you know, that knowledge to the bettering of this project? Yeah. And I, can, I, I will not forget, uh, my dad gave me the best advice. He said when... I was selecting a career to study in school. He said, how can you benefit the church with that talent you will develop or that skill you will develop? So I encourage young people now that I have the opportunity to speak to, I speak to them extensively. Do not pick a career that will only selfishly yield you. You know, pick something that you can be a productive member of society. You can benefit your family, your church family. Uh, and, and that's very important because when we pick something that we want, you know, uh, contemporary art or something like that, that is beautiful in its own way, but less limiting you from being helpful to the church, mm -hmm. we, we tend to alienate ourselves by the nature of our occupation from, from the pure and holy, uh, you know, um, principles of our Lord. Do you have something like to say? I'd like to, to link with that. To you. Uh, I was about to continue. Um, if, it's not, if it's not a prayer meeting in your area, do one, make one. Uh, one, of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest moments, uh, I do recall in a certain church, there was these uh, two young people, they had a conflict. And there was a third person, a third young person, he says, um, uh, God-fearing person, he said, let's go to talking with one of the two parties, he says, let's go to the other to, to have a few moments of prayer together in, I don't remember, it was uh, in his or her house. And uh, they went and they had such a sweet communion, they prayed together, they uh, reconciled by God's grace, you know. And you know what, they ended up, uh, at the end they said, hey, next week, come to my house, let's repeat this one, you know. And then they were doing three of them, and then uh, after two or three weeks, they still repeated, and they said, let's invite uh, uh, the other fellows in our church, you know. And then that's how it started a prayer meeting. Don't think of a prayer meeting something like a traditional program. Yeah. Think it of something, sweet communion with God and with the others and with God's Word. Amen. That can start at any time. Prayer meeting is not limited to Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday night. Sure. It can be any day of the week whenever God can put us together and, uh, and melt us with His grace. Amen. And, and especially as you're sharing now, um, those that have been, you know, uh, unfortunate, did not find an employment close to a church and had to move further. Find a way to online. connect with the church online. Yeah. Become and find a prayer partner. Something that I've been trying to, you know, uh, you know, kind of advocate. Finding a prayer partner, someone that you can connect with online, with the church, with the pastor, to have regular Bible study or even online visitations to cover a certain topic for for an hour. There are so many tools available. I, I genuinely believe in the end there will be not no one that can say 
I did not know or I didn't have the opportunity. Generally, at this point, the way COVID has shifted, you know, our lives is made it made much more possible. Anything so each else? one of us, we make a choice. Amen. Everybody makes a choice. Amen. So here we're talking about withdrawing from the company of the ungodly, binding ourselves to the company of the godly. And as Timmy brought up, through prayer meeting, through connection with the church, through finding the faithful ones, it's possible that the church too may have unfaithful people in it. It's not immune, but we can seek out the one or two and link with them. Yeah. So now as we summarize here under, under the Thursday's lesson, the f- futility of acquired riches. Notice, mm-hmm. Timmy, the other lesson, we also ended on money. And now mm-hmm. we're ending again, but this is a different type of riches that it now brings our attention to. Let's talk about how much our earthly riches do we retain when we die? <laughs> We, we don't keep anything. The only thing we take with us is our character. Yeah. And so when we think of it in the scope of eternity, this, this lifetime is so short that it's just like a blink in eternity, you know? And so, yes, we have to work. Yes, we need to survive. But at the end of the day, the only thing we take with us is our character. And so that should be our focus um, as we live our lives is that, Yes, we can accumulate riches, but they'll do us no good in the end. Yeah. We bring nothing, we take, we take nothing. nothing, right? That was the, the principle we discussed earlier. And uh, not, even the what, not even the thing we, we think that, that buys, uh, which is glory and honor, which, you know, riches, obviously, we cannot. But even that is forgotten. Yeah. You know, you, people die or move, and we say, oh, that brother wonderful brother and then experiences weather away that that you know linkage the connection kind of withers and you tend to move on and so here the bible is teaching us and is inviting us to develop a, and, and invest in what where in heavenly yeah, riches places yeah. and developing those long-lasting relationships even with the brethren that we can then cherish and nurture in heaven yeah. And, and speak to the brother and, and say, brother, that study, that prayer meeting, that connection truly has helped me to turn my life around and be grateful for, for their experience. So I encourage our visitors, our friends that are watching us. I, I hope that, uh, you know, even if you've been a member uh, of the church for an extended period of time, reach out and maybe ask for Bible studies. And have a, uh, you know, in, in our church, we have this uh, where every now and again, we will have a questionnaire, uh, more or less kind of informal, and we ask what topics does the church want to collectively study. And so then we have call for pastors and Bible workers to come and or locally, those that want to study, we, we discuss a certain topic. So finding ways to really deep dive into the Word of God uh, and shift from acquiring riches that are here on this earth that are temporal to those eternal. Timmy, you uh, wanted to add something to this? I was just thinking, you know, uh, last week we discussed about, um, was the reference from Job. He he said, I came naked, naked, I I go naked. But look, even in Psalms, uh, David says, similar, inspired by God, he says, um, verse 17, 49, 17, he says, uh, when he died, he shall carry nothing. Yep. We came with nothing, we go out with nothing. Ecclesiastes, um, King Solomon, verse 15, it says, came uh, forth of his mother's womb naked, shall return with nothing. It says, out of all his labor. Apostle Paul, inspired by God, it says, we brought nothing in this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. But um, there is something that we will care. Um, I don't want to anticipate the next question. Please, let's let's jump right into it. <laughs> what can we take with us to the great judgment? Please continue the, the thought character. as we summarize. The, the character. character. You know, because I do want to link these people. Job, we discussed about Job. David, Solomon, by God's grace, uh-huh. he was reclaimed at the end of his life. Apostle Paul. Paul, yeah. Faithful people, you know, that will take in the uh, uh, to the judgment in the great judgment day, 
their character their own character. Uh, yes, we touched last week about Alexander the Great. He said the same. I came, please bury me with empty hands. But he died as a drunkard, yeah. a young. Uh, so do not, let's not waste our life and then to say, uh, I came with nothing, I go with nothing. There is something we can acquire, the character of Christ. Sure. Uh, Job did, David did, Solomon through his sour experiences that he lived, bitter experiences, but he was reclaimed. Apostle Paul, what an amazing life following Christ. And then his character stands, uh, uh, follow, he says, follow me, follow a step uh, um, on my uh, steps as I follow Christ, correct? Yeah. So one day we'll have the joy to be there. Uh, our, uh, only our character can stand there. Amen. We don't take anything else. Amen. So as we conclude, brothers and sisters, this, this uh, morning, the, the Sabbath school lesson here, we encourage you all individually to develop a character that can stand the test of time. The character that will be free of the things we've discussed here. Envy, covetousness, greed, pride, love of money, deception, dishonesty, injustice, bad company, uh, uh, fut futility of riches. Let us overcome that. We have the examples that Timothy mentioned. Those are actual factual examples that of individuals in the Bible who are documented who have overcome. Yeah. And our experience can be the same. Bethany, would you like to say something here as we conclude this lesson this morning? I think this last note is really beautiful. It says, would you like to share with us? In view of the glorious inheritance that, that, that may be ours, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He may be poor, yet he possesses in himself a wealth and dignity that the world could never bestow. The soul redeemed and cleansed from sin, with all its noble powers dedicated to the service of God, is of surpassing worth. And there is joy in heaven in the presence of God and the holy angels over one soul redeemed, a joy that is expressed in songs of holy triumph. Amen. 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 Let us, ex inheritance, the glorious inheritance may be ours. I pray for that inheritance. I hope it is your desire. It is your guys' desire as you're watching us this morning to have that inheritance. Let's bow our heads and let's ask the Lord to dismiss us from this Sabbath school as we prepare for the divine service and as we prepare for the continuation of the study of this quarterly, that we'll talk about stewardship. Bow your heads, please, as uh, we bow ours in prayer this morning. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come before you now, dear Lord, and we're so grateful for the experiences you've documented for our learning this morning. Pray, we pray, Father, that we may have those experiences early on in our lives so we can give more of ourselves to thee in service and, and commitment. Father, we pray for those that have succumbed to uh, bad companies or have gone so far that it's difficult for them to return, or so it seems. We pray that you may bring them back home. Guide them safely, dear Lord. Please keep the angels away from uh, us and... Uh, Keep protect us, dear Lord, on this Sabbath day and um, for the remainder of our life on this earth as much as you have allowed us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you and we pray. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you for joining us today. Join us again next week as we study the lesson entitled, The Blessing of Work. God bless.